Now I'm going to bombard you with a pile of numerous reactions that simple sugars or monosaccharides undergo. Bombard, you might question? I suppose so. We could use that term anyway. But nearly every reaction that I'm going to show you here is one that you've already seen with simpler organic molecules before. So don't freak out. If anything, this should be somewhat of a review. So here goes. Aldoses, which you should remember, are just sugars that have aldehydes on one end when they're drawn in their open chain form. And ketoses, which are sugars that have ketones in them, can be reduced through treatment with sodium borohydride. So in this example right here, I've got D-glucose. If I treat that with sodium borohydride, which once again we can think of from our previous chapter's teachings as being like a source of H-. H- comes into this carbon thrust the electrons up onto the oxygen and it gets protonated in water workup. This D-glucose can be reduced to this compound which is called D-glucatol or D-sorbitol. Now, you might remember me foreshadowing earlier that all sugars exist in equilibrium between their open chain forms and their ringed forms. Thus, D-glucose shown here in its open chain form also exists in equilibrium with its ring closed form shown here to the left. Now, before you proverbially crap your pants, just relax and don't worry about it for now. I promise I'll be talking about this in more detail later on, and I'll explain what is actually going on here. Another reaction we'll learn is this one. Aldoses can also be oxidized up to carboxylic acids, which are called aldonic acids. Thus, if I take this compound, D-glucose, which is an aldose, because it has an aldehyde on the end, and I treat it with bromine and water, bromine can act as an oxidant and oxidize this aldehyde up to a carboxylic acid. Interestingly, when bromine and water is used, it only oxidizes up the aldehyde. However, if I use nitric acid in water as the oxidizing conditions, then it actually oxidizes up the aldehyde and this terminal primary alcohol. So let's compare these two. Once again, I go back. If I take a, a, an aldose like this and treat it with bromine and water, it only is powerful enough to oxidize up the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid, and it leaves this primary alcohol at the bottom alone. But if I take the same aldose and treat it with nitric acid and water, it's powerful enough of an oxidizing condition to oxidize up both the aldehyde and the primary alcohol to carboxylic acids. Now let's pretend that you have a cute little aldose like d erythros shown here, and you want to somehow make it one carbon longer. How can you do that? Do you have to use magic? I'll tell you we use this method called the kiliani fischer synthesis. Here's how it works. If I treat d erythros with cyanide, then what happens, as we've talked uh, about in the past, is the negatively charged carbon comes in to this carbonyl carbon and thrusts the, oxi or the electrons up onto the oxygen. That gets protonated in the acid workup to give me this intermediate right here. And do you see that? Cyanide comes in, electrons go up onto this oxygen, and it then becomes protonated, so it makes this OH right here. This compound, this nitrile, is now, you can see, one carbon longer in the chain than the original sugar that I started with. I can take this nitrile and treat it with hydrogen and palladium over barium sulfate and reduce it to this intermediate, which is called an imine. You might remember us talking about imines back in chapters 18 and 21. Once I get to this imine intermediate, I can then treat it with acid and water to hydrolyze off the nitrogen and convert it back into an aldehyde. I've effectively then taken my initial starting material, the sugar, and over three steps converted it into a sugar that is one carbon longer. Once again, what are the conditions? First step is cyanide followed by acid workup to get, give me this nitrile. Second step is I reduce with hydrogen and palladium barium sulfate to this imine. And the third step is hydrolyzed with acid and water to generate this aldehyde.
Now that doesn't end the story, unfortunately. As you can well imagine, this cyanide nucleophile right here can and does attack this aldehyde with equal ease from both sides, three-dimensionally speaking. Thus, this first step, I can imagine the cyanide coming in from one side to push this OH three-dimensionally going to the right. But you could also imagine the cyanide coming in from the opposite side to generate this intermediate, which has the OH pointing three-dimensionally to the left. Now, believe it or not, these two intermediates are actually different. You should note that the only difference between these two compounds right here is the fact that they have opposite stereo configurations at this first carbon stereo center only. In other words, all of the rest of the stereo centers, the one here and the one here, the one here and the one here, all have the exact same stereo configuration. It's only the stereo configuration at this position right here that's different between these two molecules. I hope you can see that. Now, if I have the cyanide come in an attack here, giving me this intermediate, I can then follow the exact same sequence. I reduce the nitrile to an imine by treating with hydrogen and palladium barium sulfate. And then I hydrolyze off the imine to convert to the aldehyde. You'll notice then that the final product that I end up getting by this sequence is different from the product that I get going in the sequence above. The only difference, once again, is the stereochemistry at this carbon stereocenter right here. In my Fischer projection here at the bottom, this molecule, diarabinose, has the OH pointing to the left three-dimensionally. The product of the sequence on the top has the OH at this stereocenter pointing to the right three-dimensionally. So you might look at these two different stereoisomers and ask yourself the question, is there a name for these two different kinds of stereoisomers? Do we have a name for this? Well, as you may recall from chapter 5, we do indeed have a name for it. These two compounds are obviously diastereomers of each other. But do we have an even more specialized name for them? Yes, we do. As it turns out, when we have two diastereomers that have the exact same stereo chemical configuration at every single stereocenter except for one, then we call them epimers. Thus, if we compare these two stereoisomers, you can see that the stereochemical configuration at every single stereocenter is identical except for this one stereocenter. In D-ribose, the OH is going to the right, and D-arabinose, OH is going to the left. So to reemphasize this point, when we have two diastereomers that have the exact same configuration at every single stereocenter except for one, we can call them epimers.